Hi, I'm Jeanette Roche. This is Bridge City News. Here are some of the top stories we've been following. Jasper residents return to their fire ravaged homes for the first time since being evacuated. Plus, Hurricane Ernesto expected to increase to Category 3 this weekend and hit Canada by Monday. And we investigate the long-term impacts of a busted Montana pipeline on southern Alberta's Milk River. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Jeanette Roche. Thanks for joining us. A U.S. official says a proposal currently on the table will basically bridge every gap between Israel and Hamas. The official spoke to the Associated Press on the condition of anonymity, saying mediators are preparing to implement a Gaza ceasefire and hostage swap deal to end the 10-month Israel-Hamas war before a final agreement is set. Mediators have wrapped up two days of talks in Qatar and plan to reconvene in Cairo next week to seal an agreement to to stop the fighting. The latest comments come after mediators expressed hope for an, an imminent deal. And thousands of protesters marched in, in Tel Aviv this week demanding the Israeli government reach a deal for the release of those hostages held in Gaza. Yoni Levi is the father of Nama Levi, one of the hostages, and he spoke out saying without the hostages the country is not perfect. Without them this country is falling apart. Meanwhile, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip say they hope the latest round of ceasefire talks will bring an end to the devastating Israel-Hamas war. Qatar is hosting, uh, was hosting that round of talks that began Thursday with fellow mediators from the United States and Egypt, as well as an Israeli delegation. Hamas is not directly participating, but has senior officials who reside in Qatar. The Gaza residents interviewed this in this video say they are hungry, tired and exhausted and are ready to go back and live their lives. Closer to home, Jasper residents are returning home more than three weeks after a fierce wildfire forced them out. They started coming in a sporadic line of cars, trucks and vehicles earlier today as the Rocky Mountain tourist town reopened to those who call it home. People driving in the uh, from from the east were met with RCMP, making sure only residents could get into town. Pylons divided the highway between those permitted into town and those required to keep going. Jasper's mayor said says some residents are worried about visitors encroaching on their privacy while they get their first close-up look at the fire damage. There are some that do not have a home to return to or who may find their home is still standing but in some way, shape or form damaged or compromised. This, I'm sure, will be an emotional day for many people and I, I want the people to Jasper to know that their provincial government supports them and has their back. For anyone needing support, during these difficult times, uh, please call 211. It's Alberta's 24 7 crisis line and can refer you to community and mental health supports near you. Our uh, heart, hearts go out to everybody who has suffered a loss from this wildfire. And I think that is everybody because even if your house is standing and you've had to leave it for uh, a couple of weeks, boy, that's a big loss too and disruption to your life. Wildfire smoke is also expected to cover much of Manitoba today, prompting an air quality warning for most communities. Environment Canada says the smoke is expected to reduce both air quality and visibility. There are more than 70 active wildfires in the province, with some forcing the evacuation of northern First Nations. An air quality advisory also covers much of Saskatchewan, with exceptions in the central part of the province and the far north. The Canadian Hurricane Center says Ernesto could cause coastal flooding in parts of eastern Newfoundland on Monday. The southwest facing shorelines of the islands Burren and Avalon Peninsulas will be lashed by large waves and a possible storm surge. Ernesto is now a Category 2 hurricane near Bermuda and is expected to track well south and east of Nova Scotia on Monday. But the storm is expected to send ocean swells onto Nova Scotia's Atlantic coast and the south facing coast of Newfoundland over the weekend. Now the latest for Hurricane Ernesto is that it is now forecast to be well south, uh, uh, the center of its track to be well south of Nova Scotia, proceeding towards uh, southeastern Newfoundland 
Um, but even there, they're forecasting a probability or possibility of, of strong winds, and that's all at this point. Um, however, as a, a journalist that's been here 20, 30 years, uh, they were forecasting four days before Fiona, which uh, was a, a, a massive hurricane in Nova Scotia that it would also miss. So there, as each day goes on, the certainty changes and it can shift back. Quebec Premier Francois Legault is fending off criticism for not visiting flood-stricken communities until, until nearly a week after torrential rain struck the province. Legault said his first priorities were making sure power was restored and damaged roads were repaired. Now he says the biggest issue is financial compensation for people whose homes were flooded. Each time in the last six years where we had uh, catastrophes, I was there. But in this case, it's unusual because we are talking about hundreds of uh, uh, problems in 10 different regions in Quebec. So my priority, Saturday, Sunday, and uh, in, in the last few days, uh, were two things. One, make sure that the 550,000 people without electricity, that they get it back. Second, make sure that all people isolated because of roads that have been damaged, that we repair those roads. It was done. Now, the main question is about financial compensation for people who had damages to their house. So we're working on that, and I think I did what I had to do. A break in a major underground water main near Montreal's Jacques Cartier Bridge has sent water gushing down streets and inside homes. Canadian press reporter Morgan Lowry says the flooding led to the evacuation of nearby buildings and a boil water advisory for about 150,000 homes. What we do know is that people woke up at about 6 o'clock and they saw this water main shooting water about some say 10 meters, some say 20 meters in the air, a, a huge geyser. And what, what officials say is that something like this, it can't be turned off easily. It did take several hours just to get the water to slow down. And they finally managed to get it shut, shut off just a little bit before noon. So we see the streets are drying out and there are firefighters going home to home and contemplating the damage, pumping water out of basements and seeing how seeing the extent of the damage. We do know that a number of residents were asked to evacuate their homes um, while firefighters go through and make sure that there's no structural damage in, in addition to just the basic flooding. We still don't have numbers on how many people have been evacuated, how many people have been affected. The firefighters say so far it looks like about 100 residents, although some of those are just basements and parking garages. So we're still waiting to see how many people. And the city also just in the last few minutes announced a boil water advisory for a good part of the eastern, southeastern Montreal. For now, for the next few hours, there's a good number of Montrealers who are going to have to boil their water. Two months after a pair of siphons in Montana burst open and tore through the surrounding hillside, the long-term effects are impacting southern Alberta in many ways and most apparent for the Milk River. Landon Hickok has more details from the town of Milk River, Alberta. I'm standing at the Milk River in the town of Milk River, Alberta, about 10 minutes north of the Canadian-U.S. border crossing at Coot Sweet Grass. And as you can see behind me, there really isn't much of a river to be spoken of. And that is because of a catastrophic siphon failure in Montana that has caused water flow rates to hit a historic low of 0.18 cubic meters a second of water in the river. The Milk River has historically always had the help of a siphon system in Montana that diverges water from the St. Mary River near Glacier National Park into the Milk River in order that irrigation may be done in the surrounding area, including southern Alberta, but primarily in Montana, where the Milk River eventually flows back into the Missouri River Basin. 
And as you can see, half of the riverbed is exposed and devoid of any water. And that's because the Milk River is only naturally sourced by rainfall and not with any help of glacier or snowpack runoff from the mountains. Well, the good news is that the Bureau of Reclamation and the Milk River Joint Board of Control are working uh, full steam ahead with the full replacement on the St. Mary Siphon down by BAP. Their timeline is pretty aggressive. They've, they've got materials, pipes coming onto site by early October, and they're 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 actively working to replace that right now. So if we're lucky, we will see some diversion flow in the Milk River probably in August or late August next year. Um, but that doesn't help the situation for residents and producers in the watershed at all. Now, shortly after the siphon failure, the town of Milk River has implemented level three water restrictions, which in short means no non-essential water use, including all outdoor use. My guess is, and, and I understand too, that they're working with the province to figure out some, you know, temporary solutions to the issue, right? So whether it's trucking water in or, you know, building a temporary system to bring water from somewhere else, I mean, that's, that's going to be within the province of Alberta that that's done. Now, while it seems that the river has a decent amount of water to compensate, and which is true, as you can see behind me, there was some help with some rainfall over the past week. It should be noted that up the river, while the river goes back into Montana before it reaches a key reservoir called the Fresno Reservoir before it reaches the Missouri River, parts of the river have completely dried up with the riverbed entirely exposed. While in southern Alberta, 8,600 acres of farmland relies on the Milk River for irrigation, that number skyrockets in Montana to 120,000 acres of farmland that's relying on the Milk River Basin for irrigation. And while we can expect a decent harvest at the end of this year, there are certainly questions in the backs of the farmers' minds as to how much they're going to be able to plant and what they're going to be able to plant due to the lack of irrigation water starting next spring and going all the way until next harvest before the parasiphons is set to be completed. Reporting from Milk River, Alberta, from Bridgety News, I'm Landon Hickok. Thanks for that, Landon. The third of the province's 11 plant addiction recovery communities is now open in Lux Saint Anne Parkland, Alberta. The Lakeview Recovery Community has opened its doors to welcome its first clients. According to Premier Danielle Smith, it's not only going to be a teaching hospital, but a 75-bed facility where men struggling with addiction can stay up to one year. This recovery community has 75 beds, which will allow men struggling with addiction to regain their health and to rebuild their lives in peace and safety. They'll be able to stay for up to one year and with access to an incredible range of services designed to help them start over. The goal is for each client to leave drug free and ready to begin jobs or training with the help of strong connections close to home. But they're not the only ones who will benefit from this community. As we continue expanding treatment options across the province for Albertans, we must find and train more professionals to run facilities and programs. So the Lakeview Recovery Community will also host the Recovery Training Institute of Alberta. This will be a provincial training hub for addiction recovery staff. Students will get hands-on experience in addiction treatment, um, the serv these services through a teaching hospital model. The facility is fully funded by the province and Smith says eight more similar treatment centers are at various stages of planning and construction. Lethbridge police say they have charged a man with arson in connection to a house fire which caused extensive damage to the property. On August 9th, just after 11 p.m., LPS and emergency crews responded to the fire at the 1600 block at 3rd Avenue North where they, wit where, uh, they witnessed the rear garage fully engulfed with the fire spreading to the home itself. The fire caused minor injuries to a firefighter and the homeowner's pet was found deceased. 26-year-old Ryan Lloyd Gerard of of Lethbridge was arrested on Tuesday and charged with arson to property. By, uh, Friday is expected that he will appear in a court. Well, Boop Up Days is starting soon, and every year this celebration brings many new and traditional activities to brighten up the end of summer. This year, Boop Up Days will bring three new attractions. Paul Kingsmith, Director of Community Engagement, explains what those new features are. 
One thing right off the top of my head is we're standing only a few feet away from our convention salons here in the Agri-Food Hub and Trade Center, which is the home of the brand new family fun zone. So in that area, we're going to have an inflatable corn maze. We're going to have a hands-on STEM exhibit where uh, people can, uh, kids can do activities and, and have fun that way. There's face painting, there's fun food, uh, there's uh, toys and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, just a new area really targeted at that family and that younger child area, uh, something that we we were missing a little bit last year and we've added this year so we're super excited about that uh, continuing our partnership with the Blackfoot Confederacy uh, we have the powwow and we have the princess pageant this year we're adding a traditional games demonstration which is something new uh, that'll take place on both Friday and Saturday here in the agri-food hub and trade center uh, in Hall C so uh, another showcase of indigenous culture that's something that we're super excited about and I'd say the third thing is uh, again here in the agri-food hub and trade center is the original six 16 patio and lounge. Uh, it's a beautiful area upstairs here that overlooks Henderson Lake. Uh, people often come into the building. They want to go in there and see the patio. So looking forward to Whoop Up Days next week, and it looks like the weather should cooperate for that as well. Uh, this evening, though, we're seeing some showers, and I will be right back with a look at the seven-day and national forecast. Welcome back. We are seeing some showers this evening, but those should be ending near midnight. And then on Saturday, we should be back to mainly sunny conditions. We could see a slight chance of showers, though, mixed with some thunderstorms later on in the day. You know, just like the news, the weather changes constantly as well. High of 26 degrees up from today's only 22. So we are going to be back above average for this time of year as we get into the weekend. Eight, uh, 28 rather for Sunday. Nice sunny conditions. Now, Monday showers actually could move till Tuesday. So we are seeing mainly sunny sunny conditions on Monday with a high of 26 up to 28 on Tuesday could see some showers there 26 for the high on Wednesday and 24 on Thursday so uh, average high for this time of year 26 degrees average low 10 36 was our high temperature on this day that happened back in 1962 and in 2000 we were sitting at the coldest which was 4 625 that is when the sun rose this morning and sun set this evening at 8 45 p.m. giving us 14 hours 20 minutes of daylight today four minutes less than we saw yesterday on the west coast tomorrow victoria sunny conditions 23 for the high seeing 60k winds in the wanda fuca strait 24 for the high in vancouver with clear skies 40k winds in the strait of georgia in edmonton edmonton could see some showers and thunderstorms tomorrow same thing with calgary highs of 22 in both of those cities as we get to the rest of the prairies uh, saskatoon regina also could see some rainy conditions with some thunderstorms 24 for the high in saskatoon 26 in regina and a lovely 26 degrees in Winnipeg tomorrow. Winnipeg seeing local smoke and hazy conditions though. As we see the central part of the country here, 22 for the high in Toronto, seeing a chance of showers, thunderstorms, showers, thunderstorms expected as well in Ottawa and Montreal. 25, 22, and 26 in those three cities, respectively. As we get to Atlantic Canada, Fredericton seeing mainly sunny conditions tomorrow, high of 26 degrees. Halifax, Charlottetown still seeing sunshine. We're not seeing quite the effects of that uh, Ernesto quite yet. 24 for the 25 rather for the high in Halifax, 26 in Charlottetown and 21 in St. John's. And by Monday, that's when we should see the effects of Hurricane Ernesto as we're gonna see facing surging waves and uh, more wet, rainy conditions by then. So there you have it, that is your forecast. Well, storms often leave behind economic losses, such as those facing some airlines in Canada today. Tracy Hamilton, owner of Inspired Vacations, says last week's hailstorm in Calgary caused extensive damage to WestJet Airlines, which damaged 16 planes. Hamilton discusses what sort of consequences the airline is still facing. The storm that happened in Calgary, obviously it was terrible the day, probably for about the 24 hours um, when it happened and then afterwards. And um, now what's happened, particularly with WestJet, of course, with it being their home base, is they have all of those airplanes that they're now having to repair. So they're making adjustments to their schedules and having to readjust which airplanes are putting on which routes and all of those sorts of things. Um, we haven't seen any international changes, so that part is good. Um, I suspect that primarily it's the domestic that they're making changes to those schedules for.
what we're seeing now is obviously it's costing the company a lot of money because they're they're having to offer their client, you know, the traveler um, discounts and flexible changes and all of that sort of thing. So. The Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says the annual pace of housing starts climbed 16 percent from June to July. The National Housing Agency says the seasonally adjusted annual rate of housing starts for July was 279,509 units, up from 241,643 in June. CMHC says the annual pace of urban starts was up 17 percent in July to 217,300 six with multi-unit homes starts up 21 percent and detached starts up two percent for the month. The agency says the pace of rural starts was estimated at 18,375 units for the month. Tribal Chairman Robert Blanchard and conservationists are urging state officials to reject plans to relocate part of an aging Enbridge pipeline in northern Wisconsin. The Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa sued in 2019 to force Calgary-based Enbridge to remove 19 kilometers of pipeline that crosses their reservation. Enbridge wants to... Uh, on, to reroute the pipeline around the uh, reservation, but needs multiple government permits to do so. The tribal chair and environmental groups are pushing back on the proposal, warning that the threat of a catastrophic spill would still exist along the new route. Now here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 21 points to 23,054. The Dow was up 96 points to 40,659. The S&P 500 was up 11 points to 5,554. And the Nasdaq was up 37 points to 17,631. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down a buck 58 to $76.58 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 6 cents to two dollars and twelve cents U.S. Gold was up forty-five dollars and forty cents to two thousand five hundred and thirty-seven dollars and eighty cents U.S. an ounce, and silver was up forty-three cents to twenty-eight dollars eighty-five cents U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at seven dollars and forty-three cents per bushel. Barley is at five dollars and fifty-three cents. Canola is at thirteen oh five, and corn is at six dollars and ninety-nine cents per bushel. Live cattle August contract was down a buck 25 to $182.80. Feeder cattle August contract was down $3.95 to $242.78. And Lean Hawks October contract was down $1.43 to $75.08. And the Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours and currently sits at 73 cents US. Recapping one of our top stories, Jasper residents return home today more than three weeks after a fierce wildfire forced them out. They started coming in a sporadic line of cars, trucks and vehicles early today as the Rocky Mountain tourist town reopened to those who call it home. People driving in from the east were met with RCMP, making sure only residents could get into the town. Pylons divided the highway between those permitted into town and those required to keep going. Jasper's mayor says some residents are worried about visitors encroaching on their privacy while they get their first close-up look at the fire damage. After the break, I speak with Associate Professor of Finance at Biola University and author of Whole Heart Finance, Shane Enet, who gives valuable financial advice in managing money and getting out of debt. And when you see news happening in your community, be sure and send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also be sure to visit our website anytime to check our number of stories and interviews. While Western society has perhaps the wealthiest group of people the world has ever seen, yet many of us are in debt and are anxious and afraid about our finances. 
But from the Christian perspective, is this how God wants us to live? Well, today's guest has some thoughts on this. Joining us from Southern California is Dr. Shane Enette. He is an associate professor of finance at Biola University and the author of Whole Heart Finances, a Jesus-centered guide to managing your money with joy. Welcome to Birch City News, Professor Enette. Great to have you on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Okay, so your book has an interesting title, Whole Heart of Finances. Maybe can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, you know, I, for me, as uh, you know, I became passionate about finance and managing money when I was uh, in high school. And for whatever reason, my uncle gave me this book about investing and it set me on a quest. I wanted to learn everything there was to know about how to manage money. It seemed like a question that uh, was had so many ways to answer and I wanted to find what's the right answer for this question. And I was also passionate about my relationship with Jesus. And so for me, I wanted to make sure that as I learned about money, it drew me closer to Jesus and not farther away. Um, and I got frustrated because the more I learned about money, the more I felt like the language around money and finance was not compatible with the language around faith. And it seemed to be almost like the better you got with money, the farther away from a passionate walk with Jesus you would become. And so when you leave Jesus out of any part of your life, especially money, since it's so close to our hearts, uh, you actually fracture your heart. And so my goal in this book is to help build a bridge between the language of money and the language of faith so that people can love Jesus with their whole hearts. Oh, isn't that interesting? Okay, well, I mean, uh, most of us are not strangers to being worried about money at least some point in our life, uh, you know, money, finances. It's, I, I think it's like one of the number one causes of anxiety, right? Yeah, yeah, consistently in the Western world, uh, when people list what they're worried about, money is the top. Wow. Uh, and I guess like with so many of us in serious financial debt, how is this impacting our family units? It's not good, is it? Yeah, debt is, uh, it impacts us in psychological ways and physical ways. So, um, you know, they, they've they shown that a lot of, uh, over 25% of Americans at least are suffering from financial PTSD and it's largely related to debt. And so they, uh, debt also has, you know, a certain spiritual um, bondage where we have less choices in our life. And a lot of people who want to go into ministry are kind of burdened by this debt and they can't. Uh, and, and then, you know, just the, the, there's, they're showing studies that our physical bodies are actually impacted by debt as well. And, uh, and so when you have, when you bring in another person, like a, an institution that, that now has some sort of power over you, um, like a bank or, you know, a, a certain person that you owe money to, uh, and it could even be other family members, but debt itself, the Bible just kind of warns us that this is something that can impact us in so many ways. And it's better to showcase our freedom in Christ to also be free fiscally. And that can be uh, show off a little bit more of who we are in Christ, which is uh, free in many ways. Yeah, definitely. I can see how that can affect the body, uh, starting with sleepless nights. And of course, that, yep. <laughs> that will start to trigger a whole host of health issues. And like you were saying, the family unit, it can really affect that as well, right? Like couples, husbands, wives. Yeah, the, the top cause for divorce and relational uh, tension is consistently listed as money. And so uh, fights over money and debt just constrains your options and it makes it so you have less and less ability to kind of weather any type of financial uh, you know, uh, trauma or emergency. And, uh, and so when you're trying to work together and money itself is already kind of this very hard subject, um, then debt just kind of like magnifies the trouble and makes it so that people often will cite money as their reason for the, their breaking up or the reason for their big trauma in their relationship. Yeah. Now, do you have any advice for couples who have opposing views of how to spend or save money? Sure. Yeah. So my, my book goes through um, a chapter on money personalities, and there's a lot of ways to categorize how people are naturally going to relate to money. And um, the once you kind of 
first step is to figure out your, your natural money personality, how you relate to money naturally, and then to compare that to your spouse or to your, um, you know, significant other. And once you've identified how you relate to money, the next step is to celebrate the strengths of that person's kind of money personality. And so I walk through the strengths and then the weaknesses, you don't try and change the other person. You actually try and work on your weaknesses of your money personality and focus on that. And it brings a great humility and so that you can kind of come together and have a better understanding of each other. And for example, if often a non-spender money personality will marry a big spender. And so there's a lot of tension around that. And so one thing about a non-spender is they can live a simple life that can be beautiful. And I, I like to compare it to Mar Maria from Sound of Music, who you know, comes to her new life with a guitar and just a bag, and that's it. And she's singing. Um, Whereas you could say the non-spender is a Scrooge, you know, who just wants to control everyone and not do anything fun. Uh, or the big spender, you could say, is this, you know, uh, person that just wants to kind of get everyone into debt and just not have any self-control. Mm -hmm. Or you could say the big spender is this hospitable person that sees and can really uh, enjoy life through the material world and make everyone feel welcome and loved and create good, beautiful spaces for everyone to oh, have community. We love those people. <laughs> <laughs> right now. So the, the, the relational conflicts happen when the non-spender says the big spender is bad. And when the big spender says the non-spender is bad, instead, it'd be great just to identify who you are and then work on creating the most healthy version of yourself. Don't try and become a non-spender if you're a big spender. Don't try and, you know, become the other person. But as you see Jesus, who has a really healthy, I call it a He's got a holy looseness about money and he's got a holy materialism where, you know, he he wants to be generous, but he also isn't fixated on stuff to such an extent that he'll get it, you know, in an irresponsible way. Um, and so as you kind of set your eyes on Christ, you actually become a much healthier non-spender if you are or a much healthier big spender if you are that money personality. And there's a few other money personalities and there's a few other ways of looking at someone and how who they are when it comes to relating to money. But that's just one example. Yeah, and probably most of us don't even recognize what kind of a spender we are. You know, it's usually other people <laughs> that bring it to our attention, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. How important is, uh, is a budget and how many people actually have a budget set in place? Yeah, budget is one of those words that uh, is like diet. Um, it's, uh, you know, pox on, on that word. And so people tend to really get uh, kind of uh, angry about the idea of a budget. And one of the big reasons is because someone who does a budget tries to restrict themselves. And usually they do it without any information about how they spend money. And so um, just like with dieting, it's better to count calories before you try and restrict anything. Uh, and with with a uh, budget, I like to use the word spending plan. And instead of going right into trying to restrict your spending, it's better just to keep track of what you're doing. And there's the book walks through a bunch of spending um, spending plan apps that you can download on your phone, or you can you know there's some paper uh, methods as well. But just tracking what you're doing, you can do with 100% success. It's something simple. Uh, it's just a matter of getting into a habit of doing it. And once you shine a light bright on your spending, you start to change. You actually start to change how you spend money because you're given the information and you also get to see very clearly what's happening and have a conversation with your with your spouse, with your family, and with the Lord. And it's a really beautiful way of... Um, being able to uh, just naturally move forward. And then what you once you, I, I usually recommend six months of tracking before trying to restrict anything. And then you can start to make a proactive plan where you're going to potentially do less of something so that you could do more of something else. Right. I like that spending plan instead of budgeting. <laughs> so what are the basics of budgeting or this spending plan? Yeah, the basics. So the one uh, way that can really facilitate a natural love of, because so first thing is you need to recognize money is not yours, you know, it's given. And so we're not an owner, we're actually a steward. Um, and getting into a steward mindset then becomes a matter of recognizing as we receive, we actually have a moment we get to be grateful. And gratitude, they've shown in psychological research, affects every single aspect of our well-being. 
And so once we start seeing that paying, you know, the DMV or the, the uh, you know, uh, car registration fee or paying uh, you know, groceries, all of that is provision. And so we get to have a moment of being grateful for the Lord's daily provision. Uh, and while we're doing that, we're tracking it. And so we track it into, let's say, you know, I, a, a budget app that's just met, automatically puts all your transactions from your bank or your credit card into one place and you just kind of categorize it. So I spend three minutes a day. Um, if I forget a day or if I go on vacation, then I'll spend about 20 minutes at the end of the week. And that's a moment of me experiencing gratitude. Uh, and it's actually an act of worship because I'm a steward and then I'm recognizing God's provision. And that really motivates me then to set a plan for the future because I want to do more. And so Paul, he he says with any spending plan, the ultimate goal is to excel in the grace of giving. And so we're, we engage in some discipline of tracking and maybe spending a little bit less so that we can avoid debt and so that we can give more. And that's kind of the goal. That's the end goal. And all of that works towards glory to Jesus and towards intimacy with him because giving engages the gospel over and over again because we're doing it in response to his giving towards us. Mm -hmm. does, does that help with the mechanics of it? <laughs> yeah, I know like in your book, you list the three keys to money stewardship and that that's kind of part of it, isn't it? Yeah, the, the three keys of just kind of recognizing that, you know, we are in Christ. So we, we are this new creation. We have this new generosity that's flowing through us. And our new mission is no longer just to save and accumulate for consumption. You know, most people's main mission in money is to accumulate, is to, con is to consume. Uh, but now we have a different mission and is to follow through with what God's doing, which is to, to help the world see his beauty, his perfection, his love. And we get to use what's being given to us with that new mission. And, uh, and so again, I, I love 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. It's the longest passage on money in the Bible. So it's my favorite uh, part of the Bible. And uh, and really, Paul's like, this is how you think about money is how can you use whatever's happening, whether you're spending or saving or giving, how can you do that in a way that's letting you excel in, in this grace of giving? And so saving is something that uh, there's a new purpose for saving. You don't not save because saving is a great tool to help avoid debt. And because uh, there's just times where you just all of a sudden stop having income and that's just a reality. And uh, and savings like a barn that a farmer may use. It's not bad that a farmer sets aside an, a surplus of crop to go through, get through the winter and then sell it. A barn makes him a better farmer. And I think in the same way, uh, our savings accounts help make us a better giver, make us better Christians because we are preparing for those inevitable winters but we don't want to get too many barns and we don't want to do it for the sake of consumption or the sake of protection because the Lord has kind of promised those things already. And so now, now we're just trying to image him, trying to show off who, you know, he is and who we are in him. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Christian circles anyway, uh, the conversation of tithes and offerings uh, come up often. So how can we get to a place of being able to give joyfully, not just out of duty and also without worry? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, 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 I think giving too often people um, just only imagine one way of giving, and that's just a percentage of a paycheck. Or um, There's actually, I've identified eight different giving systems that you could engage in. And I think you should find the one that's most, um, that you're most excited about, that's most aligned to your personality. God's made everyone different and giving is so personal. Why shouldn't it kind of align to our personalities? Uh, and so when I think first fruit giving is always going to be a part because you can kind of develop, I have three or four of these giving systems that are kind of all working together in my life. And there's certain ones that get me super excited and there's certain ones that don't. And so I don't do those ones. For example, a giving goal is where you, instead of being focused on some percentage of income, I say, I want to give this amount by the time I retire. I want to give this amount by the time, you know, my, my child turns 10 uh, and that I'm very competitive and that kind of motivates me. That gets me excited about giving. And so then and there's a lot of other ways you can give. Um, a giving circle is a beautiful way that motivates um, 
quite a bit uh, and it hits different areas of your heart. Uh, so giving circles where you just come together with a group of people, find one cause that everyone is excited about, and then you pool the money and give towards that. And uh, I could see that igniting a certain type of giving that's not perfunctory. It's not legalistic. It's just we're responding to God's grace. I like that. Uh, we're out of time here, but uh, Shane, thanks so much for being with us today uh, to discuss this very important topic of finance. It's on everybody's mind all the time, right? <laughs> it's true. Yeah. No, thank you for having me. Of course. Dr. Shane Enet is the author of Whole Heart Finances, a Jesus-centered guide to managing your money with joy. Today, we're going to learn more about this type of cancer and what kinds of treatments and supports are available. Our guest has battled myeloma himself and is the head of the Lethbridge Myeloma Support Group. He joins us here in the windy city of Lethbridge. Brian Treadwell, welcome to Bridge City News. Thanks, Nan. Thanks for inviting me to Bridge City News. Great to have you on. So, Brian, can you explain to our viewers what myeloma is and how Canadians are battling this disease? Okay, first of all, let's uh, answer the second question first. Uh, though classified as a rare disease, myeloma is the second most common form of blood cancer. In 2022, nearly 4,000 Canadians were diagnosed with myeloma, and currently 11 Canadians are diagnosed every day with the disease. Wow. Yeah, so as far as myeloma itself, and here's the medical part, and I, I don't want to get too uh, medical on it, but it's a, a blood cancer associated with the abnormal behavior of uncontrolled growth of plasma cells. That's the white blood, uh, blood cell. Plasma cells are made in the spongy part of your bone, and they're an important part of your immune system because they produce the antibodies, okay? And in myeloma, too many plasma cells are produced, and they crowd out the good cells, like red blood cells and platelets, that our body needs to keep us healthy. And when you have numerous areas in your body affected by these growth, the disease is called multiple myeloma. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And so what are the symptoms of myeloma then? Okay, some of the common uh, primary symptoms are bone pain, anemia, extreme fatigue, uh, reoccurring infections, and kidney problems. However, th anything unexplained uh, should be referred to your doctor so uh, he or she can refer you on to a hematologist. And those people are the ones that make the specific diagnosis. And is there a known cure? No, currently uh, it's incurable. However, great strides are being made in uh, increasing both the quality and quantity of survivability of diagnosed patients. Uh, a decade ago, the survivability was about five years, but now with research and uh, new drugs and treatments, people are living five, 10, 15, 20 years and longer uh, past their initial diagnosis. So wow. that's the good news. That is some good news. And uh, what kinds of treatments are available and which kinds of treatments seem to be having the most success? Okay, because myeloma is, uh, well, I call it a designer disease. It designs itself around you. Your, your uh, medical team will decide what's the best treatment for you. Uh, it's all depending on your, your age and your other health factors. Uh, you may have a stem cell transplant or not. I had a stem cell transplant. And uh, since I had a stem cell transplant, even the protocol has changed uh, for treatment then. So treatment is always changing uh, for the better because they find all sorts of new things, new ways of treating it. So it's, it's an ongoing process. So I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be. Well, I mean, uh, so you're a myeloma survivor yourself. So can you just tell us what life with myeloma is like? Well, as far as treatments go, uh, what are having the most success? Um, well, uh, stem cell transplants, uh, CAR-T therapies. Um, your doctor sort of gives you a, a, a designated treatment plan. 
uh, to put the cancer cells into remission. And that's the best possible way because it's incurable. The best place to get is to have it go into remission. And therapies evolve. Um, treatment works for a period of time that you're in remission. But then cancer, it's, it's smart. It adjusts itself to those drugs and it says, okay, I'm used to it, so now I'm going to grow again. So then you become what they call relapsed. So the doctors have to go and find a new drug to go on and put you on. And you go on that for a while and you know, go back into remission. And then the drug gets smart again and, or the cancer gets smart again and says, okay, I, I like this. I'm going to grow again. So this dance goes on and on and on until you, you know, get back in and you run out of known drugs and you're put into what they call refractory because uh, you're at the end of the line. So what happens then is your team has to look for drug trials, which uh, aren't approved, you know, by Health Canada. It's not a known, you know, produced, but it's it's um, done at universities and specific things like that. So you hope to get on drug trials, and a lot of people are on them, and their survivability is increasing again. So um, it's, it's, it's an interesting dance. Here in Alberta, uh, the University of Calgary has world-class um, uh, researchers, and they're coming up with some great new uh, drugs. And uh, I have one, one lady in our group that's been on there for about five years with a trial drug and she was initially on palliative care and she's gone to just blossoming on these on this trial drug she's, How amazing. she's doing really well so that's giving some great hope and going back to uh, living with myeloma in mm. in your experience uh, was there pain discomfort well, for for me, yours truly, I uh, I have anemia, which gives low hemoglobin. So uh, always being tired, and uh, you know that's uh, that's no fun. Uh, of of late, I've been dealing with having to go in for for uh, blood transfusions, mm -hmm. and <laughs> so. <laughs> It's uh, it's an interesting dance. I had a I had a stem cell transplant in in 2021, and um, there's a whole battery of tests that lead up to going through that. It, and your doctor has to decide whether you're a good candidate for being for having a stem cell transplant. It's based on age and your health factors. Again, uh, now they're treating. Uh, based on that, whether you have a stem cell transplant or whether you don't and your drugs that you take are um, are adjusted specifically for that. So um, as far as day-to-day -day life, uh, there's good days, there's bad days, there's in-between days. So you uh, just, as uh, Christy Lane sang, uh, one day at a, one day at a time. <laughs> one day at a time. <laughs> yeah. Now, do we know anything about what causes myeloma? Yeah, that's a good question. Everybody asks, what causes it? Well, we really don't know. We really don't know. Some say the environment. Others say it could be pesticides. Um, we're, we're not really sure. No. The cure, that's what we're after. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, are there any ethnicities or age demographics who are more susceptible to getting myeloma? Well, the median age for diagnosis is uh, 65, though I've heard as young as 35. Um, primarily, it's 70s and 80s that uh, get diagnosed. Um, and there's more of a prevalence for Asian and uh, uh, Afro-American heritage. Uh, so it's, it can be anybody. Let's face it, it's, it's, it can be anybody. And I want to go back to your experience. Uh, when you were diagnosed with myeloma, what was your reaction and how has your journey been battling this disease? Well, it, it's funny. My, I, I have to give credit to my, my family physician. 
he was tired of seeing me complaining about always being tired. So he finally said, I've got to send you to Dr. Benke. And my hematologist set me up to Calgary with a battery of tests. And uh, <clears throat> I went back to see him for the diagnosis. And he came in and sat down beside me and took a deep breath and said, you have multiple myeloma. So I just went, okay, so what do we do next? You know, that's that's the thing. I wasn't, no woes me, what whatever. It's It just didn't you know, phase you. You were just like, okay, how do we tackle this? How do we get this? Exactly. How do we get on with it and, you know, live life and uh, adjust ourselves accordingly? Accordingly, I wasn't, I wasn't going to give up and you know, throw in the towel or anything like that. Okay. It's, you know, go with the hand you're dealt. Well, what a great attitude to have uh, towards it as well. Now you lead the Lethbridge Myeloma Support Group. Can you share what a typical meeting might look like? Uh, have you ever seen a wrestling match? <laughs> no, it's it's catch as catch can. We we do we do a little bit of everything. There's no formal meeting because meetings get bogged down in red tape and all sorts of stuff. Um, we sit around in a group when we can be outside because that's the best place to be. Um, in the in the fact that uh, myeloma, you're you're immunocompromised, so you don't want to pick up diseases from other people. In the winter months, yeah, Zoom is is the preference. Uh, but you know, we'll we'll go to Timmy's and sit around and have coffees and things like that. But we'll we'll go down to Henderson Park and sit and uh, around and share stories. Uh, the thing is, it's just being able to mix and mingle with people who share the same disease. And we all talk about how we react differently to the same drug, because as I said, it's a designer disease. We all, we all react differently to the, the same drug that we're given. The side effects affect us differently. And to what degree does myeloma affect the way one lives their lives day to day? Like, are there certain things you need to avoid? Are there certain precautions you need to take? You talked about masking and being immunocompromised. It's frustrating because at times you can't plan things. Um, the way you adjust is the way it's, it's individual. Um, you'll hear a different story from each person that you talk to that has myeloma. Um, some are going on as if there was nothing wrong with them. And that's a great attitude. And, and that's, that's good. You know? Um, so you, you just have to watch what you do. Um, you know, we're not skydiving, um, because it's, it involves, uh, your, your bones and things like that. Some of us don't ride bicycles or do things that uh, will cause us, you know, that will fall off, you know, and, and hurt ourselves or, you know, as I said, I'm not, I'm not in, I'm not going in the wrestling ring <laughs> and we're not doing anything like that. Um, plans change. Uh, as I said, if, if you're not feeling good, it's okay to stay home. Um, and you're, when, when you're in doubt, talk to your doctor, talk to your, your medical team. They'll tell you what, you know, you should do or you shouldn't do. And, um, you know, talk to a dietitian if you, you need specific things you need to adjust for your diet and, and things like that. Now, this doesn't look like it affected you based on your the way you responded to being diagnosed. But is it common for depression to set in? And... What advice can you offer to help prevent this from happening? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm an old broadcaster, so I've got almost 40 years of faking it till I make it, okay? I can get behind the microphone and sound like I'm on top of the world, um, but behind and underneath, it's a completely different story. It's like a duck in the water. <laughs> um, but... You know, any life changing thing like diagnosis like that, it'll it's it's bound to change your psyche. Um, I admit every now and then I have a little pity party, 
-hmm. But you've got to keep a positive outlook. Absolutely. Surround yourself with positive people. Um, You know, read positive things, listen to positive music. Um, Don't go on the Internet. Oh, the Internet. It's it's the bane of people with diseases because you get so much uh, misinformation out there. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, but uh, the disease hasn't robbed me of my sense of humor. Uh, maybe you haven't caught on to that. But <laughs> um, Monty Pythons, you know, always keep on the sunny side of life. <laughs> life I've ever of seen a video for that, yeah. And any final thoughts on winning the battle against myeloma and any final thoughts in general? You were talking about uh, misinformation. Yeah, um, I, I always say to anybody I talk to, uh, if you're going to go on the internet, uh, go to Myeloma Canada's website, myeloma.ca. That's where you're going to find the most current information about myeloma. Um, there you're, it, it's, it's been rebranded and refreshed and it's, it's got the most current information, uh, research, pamphlets, uh, YouTube videos. Uh, it's just chock full of things. It has contact information. We have over 45 uh, support group network uh, groups uh, across Canada, so whether you're in uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia, or out in Tofino, BC, um, or up north, you're going to find groups in your province that uh, you know you can connect with, whether it be virtually on Zoom or you know in person, and, and get a hold of them. And uh, any of the leaders will be happy to get a hold of you and talk talk to you on your level about where you are in your journey with myeloma because they've been where you are and uh that's that's one good thing about it we're not we're not paid volunteers or anything like that we're people who are living myeloma just as you are living myeloma if i'm talking to you as a as a myeloma patient Brian Treadwell is the leader of the Lethbridge Myeloma Support Group. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks. I'm Naveen Day. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.